Welcome back, everyone, to our weekly series, Ask the Doctor, with Dr. Jim DeMaine. Um, this is our last episode of this series for the summer, and then we'll be back in the fall, um, and we'll have more um, news about that very soon. Um, so we are once again here with our friend, um, Jim DeMaine, um, as a way to just wrap up this um, eighth episode series. I think it's been eight. Um, where we've talked about um, advanced care planning, we've talked about um, medical assisted dying, we've talked about a little bit even about psychedelics um, at end of life, um, we've talked about how to make um, decisions as a health proxy, um, and really a, a variety of really important Topics. And today is a little bit more of a general conversation and some story sharing about the importance of end of life planning and just thinking about this very, very important topic that we all face. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Jim. Hi, good morning, Michael, and good morning, everyone. Um, again, tuning in on Zoom. Um, I understand it's probably a, a nice day and people are recovering from celebrating the fourth, I hope. Uh, today, as, as Michael mentioned, I'd just like to tell a couple stories. They're not directly uh, about dying, but in, in a way they are. And they're stories that, that I, I remember and are in my head. And I tend to think in stories and talk in stories. So that's really what I'm most comfortable with. And, and it's really, a fairly good way, I think, for learning about advanced care planning is to hear stories about what other people do. And also, we all have our own stories about family members that have passed and, and what that means to us. But I'd like to start with a story that I titled my book, Pacing Death. It, it's titled Viva Puerto Vallarta. And it, it started when I got a call from a vascular surgeon. I was on call for critical care in our hospital. And the surgeon said, uh, Jim, I'm admitting a triple A repair replacement to the intensive care unit. I'm wondering if you could see her. And by triple A, he meant abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, this was a 75 year old woman I'd never met before who was in crisis because unbeknown to her, uh, the aorta in her lower abdomen, the major blood vessel, had been ballooning out uh, and threatening to rupture. And she came in with a lot of abdominal pain. And this was a, a crisis interventional surgery to remove the aneurysm and replace it with a, a big graft, which is a major operation, as you might imagine. But she survived the surgery, but she was very sick when I saw her in the intensive care unit. Her blood pressure was quite low. Her um, urine output, which had, had dropped off, uh, she was on a ventilator, um, multiple tubes and monitors, uh, looked like a classic, very, very sick, critically ill patient. So we did the usual things, trying to get the oxygen stabilized in her blood, tried to get her blood pressure up and, and monitor. And she, she stabilized, but did not really improve. And at that point, I met uh, her son, Jerry, who was a firefighter, gung-ho, very involved guy, uh, worked at the local fire department, could spend time in the intensive care unit. And we had multiple family conferences. And he was a cheerleader for her. He sat by the bedside and said, hey, come on, mom, you're going to get through this. Uh, it's all going to be OK. Remember, we have that trip to Puerto Vallarta. And we get there, we're going to share a beer, have a cerveza. So, she got sicker though. She started to have intestinal bleeding and the, intest the gastroenterologist got involved and discovered that she had what we call stress ulcers in her stomach bleeding, but they got those under control with, and she had to have transfusions. Then she developed, uh, we're at about week three in the intensive care unit at this point. She developed what we call uh, the um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And, the lungs, when they're under attack like this and somebody critically ill, will, will tend to begin to shut down and um, begin to fill with fluid. Uh, and the 
little blood vessels in the lung tend to become leaky and it becomes very hard to maintain somebody on ventilation. So this was tricky, how much pressure to use without causing damage on a ventilator and how much oxygen to use. But Jerry kept saying, come on, mom, you know, you're gonna get through this, let's go. And then we were out about week six and she develops uh, sepsis from a urinary infection and uh, ended up requiring big gut and antibiotics. And again, stabilized. Um, a week later, again, she became septic. This time she grew a fungus out of her blood, which is not terribly unusual when you're so immunosuppressed and have been on antibiotics. Again, we gave her big gun uh, antifungal drugs and we were out at about week eight. She was still hanging on, but I, I talked to Jerry and I said, you know, if, if your mom has more complications, she may well not make it. She does have a chance. And he said, well, I, I want to keep going. But at, at this time, the nurses and I were beginning to wonder with this 75-year-old woman who we'd been giving heroic treatment to for two months, whether it was really in her best interest to, to keep going or whether it was time to stop. But in reality, she did not have a, a serious underlying diagnosis. Uh, she did not have cancer. She did not have some totally untreatable disease. Certainly age was against her and then all the complications. So, so we pushed ahead. And uh, at about week 10, uh, or two and a half months, suddenly things started to get better. You know, one day her, her lung function began to improve. Oxygen levels improved. We were able to dial down the ventilator some. Uh, she began to have bowel tones, which is always a sign of uh, music to the surgeon's ears when he can hear bowel tones with the stethoscope. And then uh, gradually we started weaning trials uh, off the uh, ventilator. And during this time, we noticed that she was still responsive. She could open her eyes, she could hand squeeze on command. There was no sign of a stroke or um, brain damage. And miraculously, really, uh, everything just started to get better. We, were, we kept up nutrition through all this. And it was kind of like graduation day when she left the intensive care unit uh, with Jerry at her side, off to the medical ward, uh, and then eventually off to a rehab center. Uh, and Jerry all the time said, Mom, it's so wonderful. Now we've got that trip planned. So was, this was a humbling experience for me and for the nurses as to, you know, when is that line? When, when do you stop the ventilator? When, when, do you, when do you say enough is enough? All along, she still had probably a 10 to 20% chance of surviving. And in, in that mode, you know, we're not really ready to give up, but we, we are wondering in the back of our minds whether we're really benefiting this patient. But there's a funny end to this story because uh, several months later in the spring, um, my wife and my kids, well, we were at SeaTac Airport ready to fly to Puerto Vallarta. And right there in the, in the lounge, I hear this voice, there's my doctor, you saved my life. And I, I looked over and I saw this unrecognizable, healthy looking uh, elderly woman uh, didn't know who she was directing her comments to until I saw Jerry. Uh, and they were on the same plane with us down to Puerto Vallarta, which was just kind of an amazing end of the story. And, and a lot of people don't believe it, but I have my wife who can verify that, that story. But, but that's one that obviously has, has stuck through my mind. And it's, it's to let you know that if you or a loved one look awful in the ICU or look critically ill, um, they're, they're, you know, you've got to listen to your own inner voice, but also listen to what the doctors are saying in terms of prognosis. And it, a case does not really become futile uh, until, you know, you've given it your best shot. And particularly where there's advanced cancer or other underlying disease, then, then you've got to really wonder when, it, when it's time to stop. But Jerry had her best interest in, at heart, and we were on board, and, and the ending was good. So I, I'd like to go on with one other story. And this is uh, 
one that you don't hear about uh, as, as a patient or even as an administrator. But th th there are, we had a couple of nurses in our ICU who are very beloved. Um, they, the crew joked around a lot. And, and for any of you that are in kind of a high intensity profession, you know there's kind of gallows humor that goes on and, and things that go on. But anyway, Cheryl and Susan, the, the two nurses, um, walked into the ICU early in the morning for the morning shift. Uh, with, they had stopped for their Starbucks coffee and were laughing with each other as they walked into the ICU. And it looked like a disaster scene in the ICU. Roommate was was uh, just uh, every every drawer was pulled out, every every uh, thing opened up. The crash cart was out. The paddles were out. They had shocked somebody. Um, and um, there were just tubes and equipment lying all over the place. And on the gurney, uh, it was a body under a sheet. And they explained it, that this was a young woman who came in very septic with a, a ruptured abscess, and they could not stabilize her or, or get her to surgery in time, and that uh, she had died on their shift. And Susan and Cheryl immediately jumped into the support mode saying, you know, what can we do to help? You know, I know you guys have a lot of charting to do. You've got phone calls to make. Um, you know, the family had already left. So they were just trying to clean up uh, everything that had to be done. And they said, you know, if you guys wouldn't mind, if you could take the body down to the morgue, that would allow us to do things here. So Susan and Cheryl looked over at the sheet and it had the, the form of a young woman and they did not want to look. So they, they just wheeled the, the, over to the back elevator to avoid visitors down to the sub-basement where the morgue is. And as they were going down the hall, they heard this noise, boom, like that. And they said, what's going on? Yeah, well, sometimes gases can escape from a body and make weird noises. And as they got further down the hall, Again, they heard boom a little longer, and they, they, they had no idea what was happening, but they looked at each other, kept going. As they approached the morgue door, the body began to sit up, it was sitting up on the cart, and they freaked out, and they just ran down the hall around the corner right into the arms of their nurse friends who had set the whole thing up. And the body, of course, was a nurse, and she ran down the hall laughing at them, and it's, it's the... Uh, pranksters that uh, had a fast run pull on them. But uh, these are the kind of things, these are the stories you don't hear about. But I'm, I'm sure similar things go on in uh, police stations, fire departments, newsrooms, uh, you know, wherever there's high stress. Um, and I, I can read you a little thing about what um, I think George Bernard Shaw said that I, I wrote at the end here. I wrote in my, my book, uh, gallows humor is endemic to many high stress occupations. If we can laugh, it seems we can work through conditions that might feel daunting otherwise. I often think of George Bernard Shaw who observed, life does not cease to be funny when people die any more than it ceases to be serious when people laugh. So it's, it's, a, it's a release, it's a, a release mechanism, I, I think in, in a way that, that we all, deal with from time to time. So Michael, those are my two stories for this day. <laughs> uh, a little different than what we've been talking about before, but uh, as, as I wrote the book, and by the way, I wrote this during the COVID epidemic, so I had a lot of time on my hands to, to delve back into to things that I knew about happen, that happened. So I, I, I tried to write about other things too, like, like resilience and uh, leaving uh, memories behind and, and even, even some humor, which may seem inappropriate, but I thought it helped to lighten things up. Uh, we're all human after all. Um, yeah. humor, humor is essential. Um, and actually, Jess, if you can hear me, let's put um, Dr. Demain's book, um, the link to it in the chat. So for those of you who are um, new um, to us this week, um, or haven't yet grabbed a copy of the book, definitely should. Um, our, our old friend Bob Hoffman is back as well, and he's got a question. He says, the Puerto, the Puerto Vallarta story raises the issue of when to declare futility. In the case, um, in this case, the doctor and Jerry came to the same conclusion, but what if they had differed? 
Yeah, it's uh, it could be a dilemma. There are, there are some uh, people that are you might call vitalists. They they believe in in keeping going. I I did mention a case like that in the book of a of a fellow who was a step grandson that uh, was caring for his uh, grandmother uh, who was. Uh, had dementia and had not recognized anybody for years and was bed bound. And when she was dying, he called 911. They brought her into the intensive care unit and uh, she got put on, on a ventilator and, and he refused to take her off. And the family was very dysfunctional. Uh, they uh, uh, said that he would have the decision making because he had been the caregiver. And, and it was a real problem. We, in this case, we just kept going. Uh, at one point, uh, one of her arms became gangrenous. Uh, the, you know, we couldn't operate on her, so we just had to wrap the arm. Uh, she was um, um, you know, beyond hope of, of any kind. And we were kind of afraid of the step grandson. He was kind of creepy. Uh, he said he was talking to God and he had, all kinds of uh, messages that she would die on a certain date. Uh, and he actually posted her memorial service for like two months hence, which we knew was unrealistic. And uh, we could have done a couple of things. We could have gotten um, a court appointed guardian, which uh, maybe we should have done early on, but th there seemed to be a lot of delay in, in getting that moving. Uh, we could have uh, unilaterally taken her off the respirator against the wishes of the family, but that, of course, is inviting a lawsuit uh, when, you, when you do that. Um, or we could have said, we don't agree with your decision. Uh, we'll give you uh, X number of weeks, you know, maybe two, three weeks for you to find another institution that will take her. But she... Uh, and this would be after discussions with the ethics committee uh, saying, okay, you have this option. And this has happened in some cases like um, the McGrath case of the young girl who was brain dead um, and th the institution said she should be taken off the respirator and the family said no and they ultimately transferred her to another place that would provide support. So, so that's a kind of, Situation. I, these things do not happen that often. Sure. You know, they, they might make the media when they do, but 99% of the time you can come, you know, to an agreement. Alignment, yeah. Well, I have a, a perennial question for you. Um, and, and this is a question that um, has garnered quite a bit of writing and differing opinions. And that is do doctors and nurses, but um, let's focus on doctors because that's what you are. Do you think that doctors die differently than the rest of us? Have you found that they're more prepared? Um, they're more clear on their goals of care and their communication, um, more likely to have DNRs, or um, do they actually um, end up in the same camp as the rest of us? Well, probably we, more often than not, we die like the rest of us, but, but we're a little bit more aware of the downside of some of the technologies and where they surveyed doctors about their willingness uh, at the end of the life to undergo like ventilators and CPR, they were, they were less likely uh, to want that. Um, I'd be willing to share my own uh, my own decision, you know, being almost 83, uh, I look at, well, you know, within the next five, 10 years, I'm going to be leaving this world. Would I really want to, you know, how do I want to die? Well, going from your heart stopping is really not a bad way to go. I mean, you just pass out and, and basically you're gone. So I don't think I would want CPR. And I've, so I've made myself on my pulse form, uh, do not resuscitate. On the other hand, I, I did say under the next options that if I had a reversible event, like some trauma or a bad pneumonia, and I had a reasonable chance of surviving, that I would be willing to be in an intensive care unit, even be on a ventilator 
um, but I still would not want hard shocks or or CPR. So, I, it, where where they've surveyed doctors, they they are more much more likely than uh, the average population to to want less technology at the end of their life to to want the DNR. No, it makes perfect sense. Um, we got a question from Bill Newman, um, another one of our regulars. Um, are there any kind of difficult legal issues you have faced in your end of life care decision making? Well, the uh, prob probably no, no different than than any any kind of situation where where you're really talking. You're you're it's an educational thing of informed consent. You know, if you, if you really talk to people and you told them about, and some often this is the family, the benefits and the burdens of what, what you're proposing. And it, it really boils down to, have, have you done a good job of, of educating? And then have you been able to gain trust? And have you really included all the important players in the decision-making process? Because it's usually when somebody feels left out or misinformed that, that they get angry. Um, sometimes, you know, I've plowed ahead and felt I'm just going to do the right thing here. Um, and, you know, if they sue me, they sue me. Uh, so that's, that's sometimes what you have to do um, in, in, a, in a situation where it wouldn't make sense to, to go against, I mean, to cave into whatever is being demanded. Yeah. I, I don't know if that helps or not. It's uh, kind of an open-ended question. Oh, sure. Um, so I've got um, kind of a, this might be the last question that, that I give you for this series um, until we start again. Um, and it's more kind of about the future of end of life care. Um, and I'm curious, you know, you've spent a long career and a long life working on these issues. Um, you've seen the AIDS epidemic, you've seen the COVID pandemic, um, you've seen lots of different things. Um, what is your, what are some of your hopes um, for what the future of compassionate care and end of life care, um, how might they look, how might it look differently? I, th I think we've come a long way with hospice number one you know and then palliative care uh coming on top of that what a, a big concern of mine is that that we don't mainstream education particularly when people get up in their 60s and 70s we all need to have that discussion we all need to have access to good planning and now you know with medicare you can have a visit with your primary care provider one big thing that concerns me is when you get clarify there. let's clear you can have a visit with your primary care provider to talk about end of life planning right that's a now a funded visit um and and they can go over and help you fill out the pulse form if you do fill out a pulse form that really needs to be in a conversation a direct conversation with you and your provider it can be a nurse practitioner or physician assistant, at least in the state of Washington. It varies from state to state. But one, one big thing that concerns me, let's say you've had that discussion with your primary care provider and they are really on board with your wishes. Then suddenly you're very ill and you're placed in a hospital. Well, the way our healthcare system is set up now is your primary care physician is no longer involved in your care when you're in the hospital. They might get some electronic notes sent back to you, but they don't really see you and they aren't involved. I think we need to close that loop. Somehow, as we get into those serious conversations about choices in care and, 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 and you're hospitalized, that primary care physician needs to be back in the loop. Somebody that you trust, somebody that your family trusts. Uh, you know, you can only do so much with electronic medical records, but medicine is kind of, high touch, hands-on trust in, in the best of circumstances. Um, it needs to be somebody that becomes very important in your life. Um, it, is that, and I see this in older people, they just love their doctor. Well, why isn't that person involved when, when they're at their end of the life? So 
that as we've tried to streamline hospital care and use all the electronic gadgets for decision making, we're we're depersonalizing it to too great a degree. So I'm hoping that somehow we can figure out how to do that. Yeah. So the primary care physician um, being part of the whole continuum of care. Right. Um, and. Um, but I yeah. think things like you're doing are so important. Things that uh, Cleveland Clinic is doing, you know, honoring people that have died, uh, bringing death into the mainstream conversation. Um, and so we can think about all the nuances that are involved and um, then feel comfortable enough to have those conversations with our loved ones. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we got one last question um, and it's uh, from Bob. And um, Bob agrees with, uh, with you about your end of life choices, um, especially as it relates to the qualified DNR. And he's wondering if it's possible for you to share the specific language that you used around qualified DNR. Yeah, you know, um, it's not really a qualified DNR. You know, you sh this is one of the problems with a pulse form, quite honestly, because somebody said, oh, they're DNR. Well, they still may want to be innovative because if you look at the pulse form, you go down to the next choice, it can say full treatment. So it seems like an oxymoron or, or a conflict where you say DNR, but full treatment. Well, full treatment means absolutely everything else except CPR, you know, doing the chest uh, thumping and resuscitation. So I, I, I was talking to an emergency physician the other day. I was going over their disaster plan and, and where they live. And he said, a lot of the docs are misinterpreting DNR. So you, just relying on a form is not enough. You know, you've got to have, okay, let's look at line two, full treatment. Full treatment can mean hospitalization, intubation, drugs, whatever, everything short of the resuscitation. So what, what I, this is where the advanced directive becomes so important to supplement the post. And I think they both need to be in that packet together where you have your post form. Uh, put, put your wishes, put your quality of life wishes and other things and, and you know, they may not have time to look at it immediately, but certainly in step two, they can. And um, I, I, I did put in my book uh, a, a qualifying statement that a, a patient gave to me. And actually, I, I copied it into my own advanced directive. And uh, it, it basically says, uh, you know, I, I believe that death is a natural process, that um, um, I would not want that quality of life is the most important thing to me, being able to recognize my family, being able to interact with them. But if I am in a state where I could no longer carry out my usual activities of daily living and cannot communicate with my family further, please just treat me with care for comfort uh, without um, intervention uh, of any kind. And it's perfectly acceptable uh, toward the end of my life to withhold feeding and nutrition and allow me to have a natural death. So I, that's kind of the qualifying statement that I put along with that. Yeah, I think that's very clear. All right, Dr. Jim, well, we've covered a lot okay. of ground. Um, and yeah. I can't wait to see you in the fall and we'll check in before that, of course. Um, All right. And we owe a big um, thanks and gratitude to our producer, Jessica, behind the scenes, making this happen. Yeah. Um, so, um, any closing words, Jim? Well, I really thank everybody for watching and uh, thanks so much for the excellent questions. Uh, I hope that we can keep going because a single conversation about this is not enough. We need to revisit it periodically. So, uh, I hope we can continue on, Michael. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, everyone. We'll see you all soon. Bye-bye. Okay.